So let's examine collisions. So what happens to two or more objects when those objects collide? Well, let's suppose we have the following two markers, and these markers are traveling along the x-axis, along the same exact horizontal axis. Now, eventually, the objects will collide uh, over some given uh, time period, and then those objects will separate. So we want to examine what the force is before collision, during collision, and after collision. Well, notice before collision and after collision, these objects aren't physically touching, and that means the contact force that either object feels is zero. So before collision and after collision, there's no physical force that either object feels due to one another. But during collision, there is a force, and this force is non-constant. So once again, during collisions, the force that both objects experience due to one another, the contact force, is not constant. In fact, the force jumps from a value of zero to a high value over a very short time period. The time period during which our collision takes place. And then the force returns back to zero after our collision takes place. So if we plot the force versus time, where the force given in newtons is the y-axis and the time is the x-axis given in seconds, we get the following curve. So, before the collision takes place, before time naught, and after the collision takes place, after time f, time final, the force that either object feels is zero. But at the moment of collision, t naught, our force jumps to a very high value, reaching a maximum at this point. Now notice our curve is not constant, so that means the force too is not constant, so it varies. And notice this change in time, this time period, is the time elapsed during our collision. Now what happens to our objects when they actually collide is the force caused by the two objects on one another causes a slight deformation in the object. So when two or more objects collide, the force causes the two objects to deform. Now let's look at the area under the curve. So we want to calculate and we want to determine what the area under this curve is. To find the area of this non-constant curve, we have to use calculus. So we have to integrate of the force multiplied by infinitely small change in time from time naught to time final. So we want to find this entire area. And recall what force is. Force, or the net force acting on the object, is equal to the rate of change of the momentum of that object with respect to time. So we can change our f and substitute it with the following two variables. So infinitely small change in momentum divided by infinitely small change in time, or simply our derivative of the momentum function. And notice the dt appears on the bottom and on the top. So that means we can cancel them out, and we are left with the following equality. Now, notice we no longer have a time term. We don't have a dt term. And that means we have to change our minimum value, t0, and the maximum value, tf, to the minimum p0 and pf, where p0 is our initial momentum and pf is our final momentum of the object. And if we actually integrate this, we get the following value. It's simply p final, our final momentum, minus our initial momentum. So we see that the area underneath the force versus time curve is equal to the change in our momentum of the object, which is also known as impulse. Now, impulse has the same exact units as momentum because it is equal to the change in momentum of our object. And it's commonly represented with a capital letter J. The vector, sim uh, the vector symbol on top simply means our impulse is a vector just like momentum is. So, the impulse of a force during our collision of two or more objects is equal to the area underneath the force versus time curve. So equivalently, the impulse is simply the change in momentum of our object during our collision. So very commonly, we use something known as the average force. 
So we said that the force acting on our two objects during collision is non-constant. So that means if we want to find the impulse, we actually have to integrate to find the impulse, the change in momentum. Now, what the average force allows us to do is it allows us to determine what the impulse is without actually using calculus, without actually having to integrate. And what the average force is, it's essentially the sum of all the forces acting on our object object and the sum is equal to some constant. So we simply take the infinite sum, we divide by infinite value and we get the average force. Now the average force during an impulse is a constant force which if acts over the same time interval as the actual force would create an identical impulse. So that can be seen in the following two graphs. So the area underneath these two curves is exactly the same. So notice the height of this curve is simply the average force and the length of this curve is simply change in t. Likewise, the length of this curve is change in t, so that means if we integrate over this value, the area should equal to, well, it's the base times the height. So the force average times our change in time. So notice that here we had to integrate and here we simply had to multiply two values out. And they give us the same exact impulse. So this formula allows us to calculate the impulse without actually using calculus. Now notice that's only because this force, the average force, is constant versus the force, the actual force acting on the two objects during our collision is assumed to be non-constant and varies with respect to time.